Hi, Disruptors and Curious Minds. Welcome to another epi uh, episode of Thinking on Paper. We have Mark Fielding joining from a new location. He is in a box, I think. Uh, tell us where you are, Mark, and what's happening. I'm in a box in Paris at Vivitech, and I might get ejected from this box in a minute because I don't have the right credentials, apparently, to be in it. Uh, but before I'm ejected, um, I want to just lay out, I'm very excited about this conversation about AI and ethics, and I'm sure you are too. So I was at the Google booth today at Vivitech, and I've taken their seven ethical principles that I want to read to you before I get ejected to use. Okay. This is what Google thinks about AI, AI ethics and principles. Number one, be socially beneficial. Number two, avoid creating or reinforcing unfair bias. Number three, be built and tested for safety. Number four, be accountable to people. Number five, incorporate privacy design principles. Number six, uphold high standards of scientific excellence. And number seven, be made available for use, uses that accord with these principles. Hmm. Okay, good, good homework. And I know our guest has a pretty awesome framework uh, himself. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into this conversation as well. Mark, really quick, what is Vivitech? Just so just so people know what's cooking. Vivitech is a, a technology conference super fair in Paris that it's about emerging tech, but um, luxury, food, automobiles. They talk about Web 2, Web 3, blockchain. There's a, Elon Musk is talking tomorrow, so there's a lot of anticipation about neural nets and AI there. So it's, it's probably one of the biggest tech conferences in France, I think. All right. Well, I'm looking looking for a download from you when it's all done. Well, amazing. Well, let's get right into it. I, we're, we're super excited because there's a lot of talk about AI in general as the technology and, oh my gosh, look at all this stuff AI can do. But then you know what we talk about here on Thinking on Paper is this intersection of humanity and technology and culture and technology and what it means to kind of do things, do things the right way. Um, so I, I want to kind of do a quick tee up for our guest and we'll let him uh, dive into a little bit more details, but Reed Blackman is with us today. And, um, you know, what I found interesting about Reed's background is we, we talked, we had a brief conversation and um, he's got a, uh, he's a, he's a, a philosophy uh, fan, but also a uh, former philosophy professor, PhD, and the means, like philosophy is a means for exploring really cool questions and thoughts and ideas as a methodology, but also to uncover uh, bullshit, which is really, really kind of a cool thing that I saw about in his background. But he was a professor at Colgate, UNC Chapel Hill. Now he's got a uh, ethical risk consultancy that uh, that works uh, with AI and, and kind of how, how people to get their heads around AI and um, yeah. do it kind of the right way. Um, advisor of the Canadian government, AWS, US Bank, FBI, NASA. But without further ado, we're going to bring on our guest, Reed. Welcome, sir. How are you doing? Good, man. How's it going? Hello, Reed. Thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. Absolutely. So maybe if you could add just a just a hair of color to this, this path from, uh, you know, philosophy, professor, um, I heard there was something to do with a fireworks company that helped inform this this future uh, consult this consultancy that you now have. Maybe add a little color and tell us about how fireworks played into all this. Yeah, sure. So I was a grad student in philosophy. Didn't make a lot of money as a grad student. Um, no one really does. Um, and there's you know I I had grown up selling stuff for my dad who was a wholesaler. Um, actually, I started delivering auto parts, you know, like uh, he was an auto parts wholesaler. So I delivered auto parts for a while. And then when uh, gas stations, uh, when repair shops went out of style, he turned to selling stuff that convenience store sells. So then I started selling that stuff. So, you know, one summer I sold sunglasses. And when the rave scene was big with pacifiers, I sold pacifiers one year, sort of door to door. <laughs> um, so I sold all sorts of weird things, beef jerky, incense. Um, and when fireworks became legal and I was in grad school, my dad said, I'm going to start selling fireworks. Why don't you start selling fire, start selling fireworks? And I'll, you know, we split up the, the regions. We were in Connecticut. You know, we split up the market. And you know, we each did our job of going door to door selling our, selling our wares. So sold fireworks for a couple of years, um, just sort of out of the back door of my, uh, back, the, the trunk of my Honda. Uh, you know, car was packed full of fireworks, backseat, 
trunk passenger seat, just surrounded by fireworks. So I'm selling my things. Anyway, to make a long story short, I built up that business over the course of 15 plus years. It's still going today, but I'm not involved in operations anymore. And that explains how I became an advisor to startups when I was a professor as part of the entrepreneurship organization there. And I looked around at all these students doing these cool new things. And I thought, I want to do a cool new thing. Um, but what's the cool new thing? I love philosophy. I love ethics. I don't want to leave that. So what would I do? Only thing that seemed to sort of naturally flow was an ethics consultant. But what the hell is ethics consulting? <laughs> is there a market for that? And I thought, you know, I looked around and I thought, no, not yet. So I kept doing my research and my, you know, teaching and writing, et cetera, et cetera. And kept my eyes open though. And then Me Too and Black Lives Matter and Cambridge Analytica. And I heard that he, the engineer is ringing alarm bells around AI. And that's when I thought, oh, okay. Now I think that ethical risks are serious reputational risks. Um, social media has made the ethical risks massive reputational risks, in fact, because people can spread the news far and wide in a way that they couldn't before. Um, and so now companies need to get their ethical houses in order, but they don't know much about ethics, but I do. So that plus a other, you know, other factors in life, like uh, I was teaching in upstate New York, my wife's career is Manhattan based, and I don't want to, you know, made made no sense for her to leave her career. Um, yada, yada, yada. I left academia, started an ethics consultancy, and now I'm talking to you too. Amazing. Amazing. One, one amazing. quick thing, you know, so, so philosophy to me is, I, I've probably in my late 30s or mid 30s, I became kind of more fascinated by philosophy and the frameworks and the structure. And I wish I had gotten into it a little bit earlier, but a lot of people think, a lot of people tend to think philosophy is like this ethereal, you know, cloudy, murky construct. And, but like what you have done with your philosophy background is to kind of bring it into this applied science to decision-making to technology. Tell me about how that bridge kind of came about. Yeah. So one thing that people don't realize about, there's two things that, at least two things that people don't realize about philosophy. One is that it's, um, it's highly analytical, at least a certain strain, the, the most sort of popular um, kind of philosophy that, philosophy that gets got done in the best research institutions in the world, you know, so you know, Yale, Harvard, Michigan, blah, blah, blah. Um, the, it's highly analytical. I mean, it's, it's close, in some cases, it's even close to mathematics. But it's it's very precise. It's not like you just smoke a joint and you think about how small we all are. That's not what that's not what you get a PhD in. It's highly precise analysis of really tough issues. Um, so that's one thing to say. the The other thing to say is that philosophers are really good systems thinkers because what we're trying to to do at the conceptual level anyway is think about the whole and all the parts of the whole and how all those parts relate to the other parts and how moving this part changes this part, which changes this about the whole. And so when you think about what, what is, what's strategy about, well, strategy is like, okay, we've got this big goal that we want our organization to achieve. What are all the moving parts that we have to push and pull so that we can achieve that goal? So I think there's a way in which the systems thinking that philosophers can engage in lends itself to strategy thinking. And then the last thing is just my personal, <clears throat> my personal experience, as I've already talked about, is I started a business, I've run a business, I know what operations looks like. It's not my first business. I've, I've had other kinds of businesses that were um, not as successful as the fireworks one, but I still learned a lot about how to run a business, especially how not to run a business. And so I've always had this kind of foot in business or entrepreneurship in some way. And so it made sense for me to bridge that stuff. And I come from a, you know, a line of entrepreneurs. So it's, uh, you know, it's sort of in my blood. Do you think there's a particular strand or school of philosophy that particularly lends itself to, to, to AI and building a framework of ethics for it? I mean, so look, one of the big di distinctions within philosophy is between analytic philosophy and continental philosophy. And there's no one, no one is totally satisfied with how to make this distinction, but the analytic philosophers are known for being really concerned with strict argumentation, making pr points really precisely, disambiguating concepts, whereas continental philosophers are not associated with that. They, they're more associated with sort of this isn't really fair, but sort of like big picture thinking, less about argument, more about insight. Again, that's not a fair characterization, but I'm just going to go with it for now. More literary, the content of philosophers are going to be more literary than analytical. Um, 
And I think that the analytic approach to, in philosophy, which is the dominant approach in the top research uh, institutions, lends itself just to the quick grasping of lots of concepts and how they relate to each other. So when I left academia, I didn't, I'm not a machine learning engineer. I'm not a data scientist, but I needed to understand AI. But I'm an expert at, among other things, I hope, um, reading, researching, gaining new concepts, seeing how they relate to each other. So I understand AI not at the, uh, the mathematical level or the coding level. I understand it at the conceptual level. And I think analytic philosophers are well-suited to understand AI because they're so good at understanding systems. Yeah, and, and the, 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 the logical and analytical and almost mathematical approach to philosophy, I ran into a, a book in my philosophy rabbit hole, uh, was a, I think it was Bertrand Russell, which the philosophy of mathematics that basically melted my face uh, in, <laughs> in a lot of different ways. But it's really interesting that you know, th there, there are actually constructs that come out of these and processes and methodologies that lead to thinking. Um, so we've got, I want to I wanna highlight our friend Rick Julian, uh, as being the first comment in in one of our uh, in our chat here, he mentions you know, and you may have answered this a little bit. Well, which uh, whose ethical frame is the default, and is there a globally embraced one? All right, so you know, there are lots of statements out there by lots of organizations, government, nonprofit, corporations, um, that say, "Oh, look, here's our here's our ethical standards," and they're strikingly similar to each other. You know, we're for fairness, we're for transparency, we're for accountability, we're for non discrimination, we're for respecting privacy. So you've key got words. yeah, exactly. They're keywords, the, but the but the agreement is superficial. You know, the the thing that I like to point out is that if you write down on a piece of paper, "We're for fairness," the KKK will sign that piece of paper. They're for fairness at that high level of explanation. So for fairness, they have a very different conception about what that level two should look like, right? But at, at, at that really, really abstract level, they say the same thing. So there's, there's agreement at this very superficial level. So it, it, I would say it's not even really agreement. It's just the appearance of agreement. Um, the question is, so there's not a default ethical frame. I don't know that there's a globally embraced one. I do think, though, that there are lots of sh what I like to call shared ethical nightmares that say a Patagonia or a Hobby Lobby are both on board with. I don't think, you know, Patagonia on the left, Hobby Lobby on the right, neither one of those organizations or organizations like them, I don't think they actively want widespread discrimination against women and people of color. I don't think any of them want um, the massive spread of disinformation to the point at which democracy is getting undermined. I don't think any of them want massive violations of privacy of citizens worldwide. I don't think any of them want that. Um, so I do think that there are ethical nightmares that people from the political left and right can coalesce around. Um, that said, there's going to be some things that are more contentious, and then different organizations are going to make different calls. But just like individuals make different calls, just like organizations like a Patagonia or Hobby Lobby make different calls on what their ethical standards are, that's okay as long as it's within certain kinds of guardrails. So we're not shooting for the one platonic ideal about what constitutes the just and virtuous world or organization or AI, what we need to do collectively is figure out what are the guardrails past which no one ought to go. And then within that, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. I don't know if Jeremy's on, on agree with me. So let's, should we define those guardrails, what they should be or what they could be? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, so I think one way to, to specify what those guardrails are is the first start out with specifying what the nightmares are um, because the nightmares are the worst things that you want to avoid. You could think about this in a variety of ways. So one way you could think is just let's, let's um, there's some evidence that certain kinds of nightmares are likely that they're already happening or will likely happen. So think about the spread of misinformation by ver misinformation, including deep fakes in a way that undermines fair, free elections, right? That, that, okay. Well, if that's an ethical nightmare, it seems like a shared one. Um, then let's put in con controls in place to stop that sort of thing. Um, now, maybe those controls include self-regulation. So for instance, a variety of AI companies now are figuring, trying to figure out how to watermark um, AI-generated content or label everything that's generated by AI, by AI. This has been generated by AI. I don't think that solves the problem, but it's something. Um, as opposed to something more draconian, which would be something like, 
a regulation or a ban on all deep fake technology, but that's not, that's not going to happen. And probably it shouldn't happen anyway. Um, then another way of putting it, um, you might focus first on uh, avoiding the violation of human rights. So you might say, okay, so look, we already have a human rights framework that's internationally agreed upon. It's required of all organizations to do a human rights assessment for all the AI that they're creating throughout the human rights, throughout the AI life cycle, and to engage in robust uh, risk mitigation, human rights violation mitigation strategies and tactics throughout that, and to document it and to be transparent about it with the relevant authorities. Before we go on, can I, I just ask a, a question? Because um, we talk a lot about Web3 and obviously there a lot of bad things happened in Web3. And I heard somebody the other day saying that, referring to Web3, in Web3, bad things have to happen to get frameworks in place. We, I guess my question from that is, you're talking about nightmares. If we talk about nightmares, if, if Pandora's box is open, if, if the, the, the genie is out of the evil bottle, can it be put back in? Do we have one go at this, technologically speaking? Or? No, probably not. I mean, you know, the automobile came out and safety and seatbelts came out a lot later. Right? So there, there's, there, there's ways of, of, of um, what's the word? Uh, retracting you know, or augmenting or retracting certain kinds of things. I, I don't yeah, know. I guess we can retract. So that said, you know, the longer you wait, the more people get seriously harmed, including killed. Um, the, the more human, the more people um, whose human violates, we violate. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think this is sort of um, one and done, but, you know, the earlier the better. <laughs> Just on the nightmare, I'll have one more comment on the nightmare. I, when yeah. I was speaking to Google today, they said that one of their pillars was that it can't be used by weapons developers. <laughs> Maybe that's well, the... yeah, but here, so that's not going to happen, unfortunately. So here's the thing. Um, the, the EU is making... A great strides in passing what's called the EU AI Act, the European Union Artificial Intelligence Act, which is the first set of regulations, you know, big regulations around AI. And there's a carve out for military applications. So it's sort of like, listen, corporations or startups, businesses, nonprofits, you can build AI. Here are some kinds of AI that you're not allowed to build. And here are some that are high risk scenarios where you have to do an extra layer of due diligence. Um, but it specifically says these applications are not don't apply to military personnel. So eh, we're not going to see anything around restricting militaries agreed upon across many countries for a very long time, if ever. So, yeah, I agree, though. That would be a nice place to see it. And it's going to be the last place we see it. <laughs> yeah. History's kind of shown that with with technology and, and knowledge in general. Right. With that. Um so we've got some great questions coming in. I'm going to, I'm going to flash a few uh, up on here. You know, Anya makes a, makes a good point. They had a lot of fear in AI comes from the lack of understanding. Reed, I noticed something in your book. And by the way, Reed has an amazing book called ethical machines um, that, uh, that is out there for more information on his thoughts and processes uh, related to AI ethics, but explainability was kind of a, kind of a pillar that you, that you talk about. Um, how does that fold into Anya's question? Uh, it's it's slightly different. So so Anya's question is about shouldn't we shouldn't we educate people so that they can per participate in the discussion? I mean, yes, that's nice. That'd be good. I'm all for it. Um, I sort of though think about this more in the way that I think about protecting protections against predatory lenders. Now, I don't know anything about predatory lenders, how they operate, what techniques they use. I just know that certain people have had, you know, certain experts have had conversations around these things, regulations are put in place and it's not allowed. And I'm grateful for that. Um, but I don't want to learn the details of, of, you know, the regulation. I don't, I don't care. I'm not, I'm just not interested. I don't want, I don't have the time, the interest. And there's all sorts of things from which I'm protected and other citizens are protected because smart people figured out how to protect the general citizenry without expecting the general citizenry to get educated on these topics. I sort of think that way about AI as well. It, we can't rely, you know, if people want to get educated, there are plenty of resources out there. Um, I think my book is one of them. I hope it's helpful. Um, but it, we, the issue is not educating the general public. It's educating uh, 
it's educating lawmakers, policymakers, those sort of people to make sure that they pass the appropriate protections for people because we can't rely on individuals to protect themselves because it's just too complicated. It's too hard. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's too big of an ask for individuals. Um, the explainability issue that you referenced, Jeremy, is, is different because the explainability issue is about how do these AIs operate? How do the models operate? So you have input data, like, you know, here's a bunch of, here's applications for a mortgage or applications for admittance to a university, or here's this prompt into the, into Bing or open at or the chat GPT or BARD, or whatever. And here's the output, you know, give them a mortgage, deny them admittance to the university. And here's the letter to the, you know, whatever. Here's the letter that you requested that I write, you know, the, in the LLM case. Um, we don't know. The issue of explainability is how did it transform those inputs to outputs? And in, in many cases, we don't know how it did it. We know that it's by virtue of following this really complex mathematical pattern, but the mathematical pattern is, you know, 112 pages long. We can't understand what the hell that is. It's too, we can't keep all that math in our heads at once. And so it's a black box to us. It's opaque to us. We can't grasp the rules by which inputs were transformed to output. So that's the explainability problem. And then there's this complicated issue um, about how important is explainability? When is it, when is it important? What are the trade-offs and, and demanding explainability? Um, that's actually, if I can plug my, my, not the book, but the podcast, Ethical Machines, that's what I, uh, the discussion I had yesterday with um, the, head of, uh, the head of responsible AI at J.P. Morgan, Christoph Harampoli, about maybe explainability isn't all it's cracked up to be. It's complicated. It, no, is in it, going into explainability a little bit more, is that like offering enough of a gist of how something works to, to let someone trust uh, the output of what comes out? Like, so if, if, if I'm using some sort of AI platform and I'm trusting it's out, I'm a doctor, right? Yeah. I'm a doctor and I'm trusting this AI output to tell me if someone has cancer, right? That's yeah. a big thing, right? So is that kind of the explainability thing? That's one of the major reasons why people think we need explainability. If we don't understand how it works, then we can't trust it. I'm not totally convinced of that line. I mean, look, if it performs phenomenally well, you know, it's, it seems to be really reliable, at least based on historical data, it might be worth it. So let me, here's, here's the thought experiment that um, is fun to think about, I think, and useful. Um, look, suppose we've got this magic box, okay? And we, it's got two buttons on it, button A and button B. And... Um, We've hit button A a bunch, we've hit button B a bunch. We've actually been a little bit careless about that. But we've learned that every time we hit button A, a random person dies. And every time we hit button B, a random person gets cured of an otherwise fatal disease. Now, we've done this enough, and we might think, okay, listen, first of all, it, everyone, stop hitting button A. We keep killing people, right? So it's, it's shown us enough of, its, of how it works, or what it does anyway, that we should, we are morally obligated to stop hitting button A. And it's cured so many people every time we hit button B that we might be, not only might it be morally permissible to hit button B, but it might even be morally required to hit button B because it keeps curing people. This despite the fact that we have no idea how it actually works because it's a magic box. So this is just a way of saying, you might come to trust a thing and how it works because it, it has been sufficiently reliable in the past. I'll give you one last example. Um, you don't know, it, especially, you know, I don't know how my eyes work. I, I have no idea. But I use them all the time. They, they seem to be quite reliable. I'm reliably sort of spotting things and grasping them, picking them up and moving them around and putting this thing to the other, next to the other thing as I see it. Um, it works. And yes, there are people who understand how eyes work, um, but there weren't always. And yet people were justified in trusting their eyes, you know, 500 years ago um, because they served, they, they turned out to be really reliable things. Um, so things can be reliable and in some sense trustworthy um, if they prove to be sufficiently reliable, even if we don't understand how they work. That's not, a, that's not me saying, so it's a free for all. We don't need an explainability. Just use, you know, black box AI. It doesn't matter. No, no, no. You got to test the hell out of it, right? You have to really test it and make sure that it's appropriate. But on the face of it anyway, it doesn't seem obvious to me that we always need explainable AI in order for um, it to be trustworthy in the sense that, yeah, you're justified in using it. It's, it's, it seems like you're justified, it's, it's sufficiently safe to use.
Yeah. And then there's another thing that I tend to think about, and, and this may lead into some of the programs that you're talking about and like these, these F AI ethics councils within organizations that constantly monitor and have KPIs and all of that kind of stuff. You know, you're talking about the button A and the button B example, you know, so say over time, we learn that every time you hit button B, even though it saves a life, every 25th time you hit button B, four cats die and a car <laughs> hits a wall or something, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, so, <laughs> yes. There needs, that, that's sort of built into, uh, at least in, it's supposed to be built into the, how we tested the hell out of it, which includes not just looking at its immediate effects, but it's but either knock-on effects or occasional effects to your yours is the occasional effect, right? So um, every once in a while that we hit button B, some really bad slash apparently very weird thing happens. Um, uh, yeah, that's part of the testing process to see if it's sufficiently safe. And it's, by the way, as you mentioned, it's also very context sensitive. So have we tested it in this particular context? You know, so to give you one example, there's lots of talk around using large language models for diagnoses, diagnosing patients. In fact, doctors are doing it right now against the advice of companies that create LLMs, but they're still doing it. Um, Let's say we test the hell out of these LLMs and we figure out, you know, in, I don't know, oncology context, they turn out to be amazing. Let's use them. But we don't know how good they are at, at being geneticists, right? So we might think that the black box is sufficiently reliable and safe and, in fact, amazing in one particular context, but that doesn't give you clearance to use it in all the other contexts because you still have to do um, testing and testing there as well. So the, the context sensitivity matters a tremendous amount in what that due diligence looks like. That, that seems incredibly vital and important to me as well. Um, could you just gauge the, the opinion of the audience on what Reed was saying about whether you have to trust or understand the, the AI to trust it, or if you have to understand, I mean, just to see what the general consensus in the, in the audience is, if they agree with that or if they don't agree with it. Jeremy, maybe put a yes if you agree, no if you don't agree in the chat. I like it. I like it. And speaking of chats, while we're waiting on some feedback to come in from there, uh, Dylan uh, jumps in with uh, some experience on the uh, uh, philosophy and ethics side. I'm not going to, is that Alistair McIntyre? Is that how you say that? Yes. Yeah, as as um, uh, are you familiar with that? And, and what, what do you think of this question? Can we unpack that? Yeah, do I agree with him that a shared understanding of the situation is key to healthy moral discourse? I mean, sure. <laughs> I mean, look, um, fractured understanding or lack of understanding is going to lead to mis you know, bad communication. So if you have bad communication generally, then of course you're not going to have a healthy moral discourse. So, um, I mean, we need a shared understanding of the facts. Um, so yeah, you know, we need to understand how AI works. I mean, you know, one of the problems that I have with the AI discussions, uh, AI ethics discussions, is that they remain at a very superficial level, um, especially at large organizations. So you see the headlines, biased AI, you know, facial recognition software um, misidentifies black people, uh, you know, more often than, than white people, for instance. And then you get organizations saying, oh, yes, biased AI, that's bad. How do we fix it? Let's fix it. And then they want to start implementing policies or controls or get some tools to fix it. And I always tell them, you got to slow down. You don't understand the problem yet. Um, you got to go deeper on the problem. Yes, bias bad, agree, but it's complicated. There's many sources of biased AI. So people will talk about things like, oh, the training data isn't representative of the relevant blah, 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 the populations. And that's the source of bias in some cases, but there's lots of ways you can come out with bias or discriminatory AI. That's the first thing to say. So it can be from the training data. It can be from your objective function. It can be how you weight the input variables. There's all this you know, technical stuff that leads to, to biased outputs. And then there's a question about whether a biased model is always bad to use. In some cases, a biased model might be, A, less biased than the human counterparts. Or in some cases, biased model plus biased human is less biased than biased human or biased model alone. So let's have the, don't toss the biased model if you pair it with the otherwise biased humans, but train them in the right way to interact with the biased model in a certain way, you'll get better output. So seeing biased models as parts of a whole and recognizing that we care about the impacts of the whole as opposed to just this little tiny thing called the model um, is really important. So understanding all of those ways 
that we need to, that bias might creep into a model, how the biased model fits into the larger structure, the larger whole. You need all that understanding if you're going to have a healthy, fruitful um, discourse, moral discourse, um, as that person said. And also if you're going to have actually operationalizable, useful strategies and tactics that you can actually employ at an organization. Absolutely. A, a couple of your, uh, a couple of your quotes, I think, I don't know if it came from an article or maybe part of your book. Um, but I'm going to reference two of them in, in this, in this next line of discussion is, you know, AI, AI products are, are like circus tigers. I'm going to paraphrase this. Yeah. You, you train, you spend time training them. They perform really well until they bite your head off. Right. I think that's a really interesting way to look at that. But then also, AI is, is fancy software that learns by example, right? So that's like all of us. Like, Reed, if you're, if, if you're the input and, you know, uh, you're training Mark and I on, on ethics, right? We're relying on your input. And then that generates our particular machines, our brains to do certain things, right? The tricky part, and I think you highlight this really well, is this is at, at scale, whether it's automation of decision-making and automation of risk, I think both together. So is there a way to police or double check the input methodology, the training methodology um, to get comfortable with the output? Because there's, there's, there's a bunch to say. There. A lot of stuff, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's see. Good one, Jeremy. <laughs> um, so, okay, let's see here. Well, the let's, I'll, I'll just answer that last, that last bit at least to start. So... Yeah, you can look at input data, training data in a variety of ways to see if it might lead to certain kinds of problematic outputs. So for instance, you can look to see if any of your training data includes information that you shouldn't have in the first place because that constitutes a, a violation of privacy. So if I have, you know, oh, I'm looking at this training data and, you know, oh, I've got all this highly personal information about Jeremy, about the websites that he goes to and how frequently he goes to them. Or whatever. I shouldn't have that. So maybe I shouldn't be using it to, to train my AI in various ways. So that's one, that's one way that you can look at training data. Another way is um, you might wanna see, in some cases, looking at your training data can show you that you're probably gonna get bias or discriminatory outputs. So for instance, to take, a, take a, well, a well-worn example, if you're building facial recognition technology and you want to, you know that you're going to use that facial recognition technology, let's say in New York City, where there's a diverse, uh, a diverse population, and there's, I'll exaggerate here, in your training data, you've got three photos of black people and that's it. You know that software is gonna be really bad at recognizing black people when you, when you deploy it in New York City um, because it, doesn't, it hasn't, doesn't learn, it needs a hell of a lot more of examples than three, right? Um, and you, so you know that, okay, our training data is not good enough because it's not sufficiently representative of black people such that it's gonna be able to recognize black people. And so that's, that's another thing. That said, there's also loads of places where the damage doesn't come because of the training data or what, what the training data looks like. Um, again, take an example with which everyone is familiar, just take self-driving cars. Um, you're not gonna just stare at the training data and be like, yep, yeah, this is gonna be a safe car. You can't stare at the, you gotta put the thing on the road, see how it performs. Um, and then you're gonna make certain kinds of tweaks and maybe those tweaks will involve tweaking your training data, but there's other things. There's lots of different things that you might do in, in addition to um, uh, tweaking your training data to make the car, to make the car more safe. Um, what's another example? Uh, anyway, I mean, you know, there, there's just, there's take, um, let's think about LLMs for a second. Um, you might think that the, the large language model is objectionably manipulative in some way, that the way that it interacts with people, let's say it's a sales chatbot, is starting to poke and prod people in certain ways that stoke fear and FOMO and gets them to buy things they don't want, or it obscures certain kinds of options for um, what they could buy and it gives them the more expensive options instead, something along those lines. Um, you're not gonna get that from staring, I don't think you're gonna get that from staring at the training data, which you're not allowed to stare at anyway because the companies that make the, the, the large language models don't let you see the training data in the first place. So but you're probably not gonna spot that by just staring at training data. You're gonna spot that by continually testing it seeing oh this thing is a real this thing is a greasy salesman <laughs> so and then you then you have to start you know giving it different parameters or guidelines or guardrails like hey don't be so greasy um and then it gets you know I ideally anyway it gets better so looking at training data is in some cases the appropriate strategy in some cases it's not 
Sometimes you need a greasy salesman. <laughs> right. Sometimes you need a greasy salesman and you might want it. And there, you know, and the, the, okay, a greasy salesman, not the worst thing in the world. Um, but then one concern is one day this thing is selling you sneakers and the next day is selling you a conspiracy theory. And because yeah. you've learned to trust it, because it's been so yeah. great at selling you sneakers, um, and now it's selling you this, you know, belief without you recognizing that it's selling you this belief, it's, you know, it's a bit of an issue. That's the thing. So it's really interesting to me, fundamentally kind of in, in the realm of how human beings work, you said trust and belief, right? So we love shortcuts, right? Our brains love shortcuts and yeah. they're based on people we trust. And if I trust you and what you say, that influences my belief. When it becomes a belief, I'm going to defend it you know, in wrestling yeah. matches against everybody, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is all of that at scale, right? Yeah, Which is totally. super daunting, right? It's terrifying. No, I, I think this is one of the biggest problems. Um, people, there's already this thing called automation bias where people just trust the outputs of software, computers, whatever. They're like, oh, it's a, it's a computer. It, you know, it can do no wrong. It doesn't make mistakes. I mean, it can because these things are programmed by people of course. Um, so, but there's this thing called automation bias generally. We're going to get it with chatbots for sure. Um, people are lazy. Um, and then, yes, they suffer from confirmation bias, which is once they believe a thing, they seek out things that confirm that belief and they discard evidence against it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big problem because, you know, this is one of the reasons why there's a lot of talk about transparency around large language models. I mentioned this earlier. And doing things like labeling, oh, this is generated by AI. And I sort of think that's not gonna do a damn thing. Um, maybe that's a bit strong, but it's not gonna do enough because the large language models, and actually I'll just say generative AI more generally. So think about um, text, image, video generated by AI for political campaign purposes. And it says in the corner, this video and the text generated by AI. And you know, oh, okay, this is, this is fake. but our emotional system or the, you know, the, the, the um, uh, I can't think of the word, but our emotional systems are not tied into truth, right? Um, you watch a movie, you read a book and you're crying because that person died, even though you know, they're not really dead. Um, you're filled with joy because that couple fell in love, even though, you know, really they're just acting, but our emotional responses aren't tied to truth. It's tied to something else. It's, it's in many cases, it's subrational. Um, so you're going to watch time. these videos, these ca political campaign videos, for instance, intellectually know, okay, they're not really eating children, but you're going to have this emotional response that's sort of like, ugh, those people that you're not going to be able to control. And that will, that will non-rationally influence your otherwise rational processes. So there's lots of talk about transparency and watermarking generative AI. And I think that speaks to us as intellectual um, creatures, but not as emotional creatures. And that's where the danger is. Well, and then, and then going back to the idea of story, right. And that's how we connect and communicate and how our emotional limbic yeah. systems are, 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 are activated. Right. And story is math. We talked about this a couple of episodes ago where there are certain frameworks in story yeah. that resonate more than others. The, right. the hero's the journey. Structure, yeah. Yeah. All of that stuff. Yeah. Right. So those are yeah. equations, yeah. right? Said, Go ahead, Mark. What was that? The truth. Well, it's like we just said, isn't it? Like those examples of you, you cry in the movie, even though you, you know, you don't know the people and you know, it's not real because like you're not, it's the storytelling element that kind of overrides your rational mind. Yeah. So it's because of like maybe the limbic system, like you said, Jeremy, but that that's how do we, okay. I'm, a, I'm wary of time now. How, what do we do about that? Um, <laughs> huge, huge, huge monster in the room, Reed. You smoke them if you got them. <laughs> um you know i there's the it's it's not it's not obvious to me because one of the problems is that it's not just something like oh big organizations you can't do this let's regulate against this it's you know it's state actors right so you know the russians or whatever so regulations and in the states is not going to stop that from happening um and then it's individual just bad actors but regulate you know so we're gonna have to, I guess we'd have to have laws against individuals spreading misinformation, but this butts up against free speech issues. Um, so I don't have, you know, I'm not gonna be able to give you a sort of, I'd love to, but I can't give you sort of a pithy, like, here's what we need to do, because I don't think anyone actually knows the answer to that question yet. 
Um, or at least I don't know okay. anyone who knows it. Um, but so I do think we're going to have to have some out. kinds of laws and regulations built around the intentional, you know, intentionally deceiving people, as, uh, especially on political matters as not being um, acceptable, legally speaking. So quick, uh, quick chime in from uh, from the chat. Uh, looks like everyone is not fully trusting AI to do all of the stuff. Uh, <laughs> they're 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 double checking and vetting their answers, and they're using them as catalyst tools. I think, which I think a lot of us are are, are exploring with, which I think is cool. Here's something interesting, Reed, that I want to want to chat about is the fuel the the thing that powers AI systems is data, right? And there's this interesting seesaw as a person, how much data we give up. And it's this, this is probably a philosophical construct too, like uh, security and convenience, right? So an example yeah. would be, I love Waze, you know, the app, yeah. it gets me from point A to point B, <clears throat> it steers me away from traffic, it's pretty cool. But yeah. guess what? I'm basically letting them know where the hell I'm going, whenever I'm going. <laughs> um, so how does that, how does, how could we as individuals, um, you know, kind of help with the front end of this fuel, really? Uh, well, okay. So, you know, in the utopia, uh, blockchain and Web3 solves all that because every individual gets control over their data and, you know, grants permission or doesn't grant permission, yada, yada. I don't, you know, I'm skeptical that's going to happen. Um, I, there's, it's going to take, a, we, have, we don't have enough time, but my, my sort of general view on this is that um, number one, it can't be on individuals to protect themselves. It's, this is like the credit, the predatory lending thing. It's too complicated. I mean, the amount of data that you generate, it's insane. So for you as an individual to get a grip on all that data that you generate, who has it, where they have it, what they're using it for, the, you, there's no way. I mean, suppose I created, you know, I had a magic wand and I created a dashboard with toggle switches with all your data and who has it. And you've got to go through and toggle on or off who can have your data and who can't for, because this is going to be really helpful to you convenience wise. So you want them to have your data, but you don't want them. That's a full, that's more than a full-time job because you're generating more and more data every day. So I think that it's going to have to be consumer protections or citizen protections, not individuals having control over their data. I don't think that's, that's going to be the, the, the way to, to, to protect people at scale. It's going to be, have to be government stuff. Um, the other thing to say is I'm less, I'm not up, I'm not as worked up about privacy as such as other people are. I'm less concerned about companies having data about me stored in a server that nobody looks at and more concerned with how is that data used to violate people's rights, to wrong people, to harm people. So it's not the having of the information, so to speak. It's the using it in a way that's harmful that I'm more concerned with. Yeah. Makes sense. And then, and then also just the, the, the security convenience side, if I have to authenticate a wallet to, to ways and uh, appropriate toggle switches and all of that stuff before I can get to my address that I'm already late for, you know, that that's, that's a whole nother can of worms, but yeah. uh, we are, we are button up to time. I wanted to ask one question um, related to like, if you were the CEO of, you know, a large tech company, we're not going to, we're not going to name names. And I know this answer could be a 10 day workshop, right? Yeah, yeah. But like, you know, you jumped in and your first board meeting, someone's like, Hey, so this AI stuff, we should probably look into what is your, what is your hundred thousand foot view on the steps you would take? hundred thousand foot can, view is yeah. Could I add an addition to that as well? And in your experience of speaking to the brands, cause I know you and you speak to a lot of brands, a lot of, CEOs, how are they reacting to what you're saying? Because I feel that as individuals, we, we, regardless of what we think, we don't have much say in it. I think a lot of what happens comes with the CEOs and the, and the tech companies who are developing this. Are, are they with you or are they not so bothered? Yeah. Uh, I would say, you know, they're getting there. So two things. So um, one, they're definitely getting there. Um, progress is being made. You know, I've been in this business for five years and I've only seen more and more companies get involved and, and, and want guidance and help in building AI ethics frameworks or responsible AI frameworks. So, you know, that's what I've been doing for five years. And so that's only increased. So that said, um, no, we need a lot. We do need more buy-in. Um, m most companies don't really care much yet, at least in terms of their actions taken. Um, the view from 100,000 feet, 
is I say, take the ethical night, what I call the ethical nightmare challenge. Um, so I'm talking to the CEO or the board and I say, look here are the, at a hundred thousand feet, here's what you got to do. Define your AI ethical nightmares or your digital ethical nightmares and put controls in place to massively decrease the likelihood that they're going to happen. That's the 100,000 foot view. And from that view, it's, it's simple. Tell me what your nightmares are. Don't strive for the ideal. Don't, you know, we're not looking for, you know, the perfectly virtuous organization. Just tell me what your organization's ethical, reputational, re regulatory and legal nightmares are and put controls in place to stop them. That's it. And now, you have to go through a process of defining those nightmares and putting those controls in place. But at the hundred thousand feet, it's simple. So when people say, Oh, it's ethics, it's squishy, it's subjective, it's mushy. It's uh, forget it. You can tell you what I love about nightmares is that they're vivid. They're specific. People know what their nightmares are. It's not squishy. It's not like, Oh, maybe, I don't know, you know, massive violation of all of our customers, um, data privacy. Nah, it's mushy. No one thinks that's mushy. They think, Oh shit. No, we don't want that to happen. So define those ethical nightmares in a comprehensive way and then systematically and comprehensively put, in control, put controls in place to stop them from happening. Easy. So, <laughs> so easy. Yeah. Check. So easy, guys, easy. that's all you got to do. Hit that, hit that. And we're good. Uh, <laughs> Reed, one quick follow on. So whenever you're proposing something that's new and different and potentially contrary to uh, general business strategy, it's a new thing. Like we're trying to navigate this net new thing. Yeah. You have to find kind of champions in the org that have a relatable tangential view of that. I, I would think like the cybersecurity side of the fence in orgs or like chief technology officer, CIO, do you find that that mm -hmm. message is kind of a way in to, to have a bigger conversation? Yeah, that's right. It's usually like the chief tech, the chief data officer, chief analytics officer, chief data and analytics officer, uh, chief information officer, chief technology officer, chief innovation officer. It's usually someone on the tech side of the house but then I always have to tell them, listen, it's awesome that you guys are, you know, spearheading this, but you also need to bring in people from risk, compliance, legal, cybersecurity, HR, because at the end of the day, it's a cross-functional effort and it's, a, and it's an enterprise-wide effort. And so you have to have cross-functional senior level buy-in. But yes, it's going to be, a, it's, I, it's, in my experience, has always been a senior executive on the technology side of the house that's spearheading the efforts. Got it. Got it. Mark, uh, were any, any final questions or thoughts from your side? Um, I think maybe we, if we would be so kind, maybe you could point us in the direction of some of those people that we can invite them on. But so we, we reverse engineering the end of the world to make it not happen. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. That's, I think, I think that's right. Yeah. That's, that's what we should be prioritizing. So some people say, Oh, AI ethics is about doing, you know, social benefit and doing good and like a positive social impact. Like, oh, that's great. Go do po that, but that's not priority number one. Priority number one is let's not blow everything up. So, all right. So I'm going to loop <laughs> this all the way back to a philosophical through line. So we're just going to, we're just going to go back and dust off some of Seneca's letters and talk through, you know, Hey, what if you have had the crust, the, the moldiest bread, the shittiest clothes, no money coming in, what happens and what do you do? It's kind of the nightmare exercise, right? Well, I mean, the Stoics thought you would only you could you could still be happy, um, and be like that. Whereas yeah, I don't think at the end of the world, Stoic Seneca's there sitting on his chair, going, "I can only control my reaction to yeah, this." Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, oh, go ahead, Reed. No, but you know, businesses don't want to are not gonna are not gonna uh, starve themselves. They're you know, the, the 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 thing that businesses need to understand is you don't have to crater your bottom line. This is not about this is not about stifling innovation it's it's about stifling really ethically bad innovation so when people say oh it's not about stifling innovation well in some sense it is you want to stifle the ethically bad innovation but there's tons of innovation to do that's not ethically bad so do that stuff um which is also good for your bottom line it's also good for your brand um so for businesses i think that they need to understand that this is about weaving, weaving it in. It's about an ethical risk appetite that's compatible with business risk appetite, operational risk appetite. It's all sorts of risks, right? Um, so weaving that into your general risk posture. Um, and then for governments, regulators, et cetera, it's about really let's, let's at a minimum, you know, it's our function as a government to protect people from the worst. Let's put in regulations and laws to make sure that people are protected from the worst. Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, we're a little bit over time, Reed. I think we could we could continue to unpack this. This was a this was a, a, a just a, a a dip into like 
this intersection of, of ethics and emerging technology. Your background is amazing. Uh, your, your ideas have sparked a lot of uh, rabbit holes in my mind and hopefully for those, those of our guests as well. A couple of quick things for those listening. Um, we'll, we'll post some links to Reed's work and um, his yeah. book, Ethical Machines. We'll make sure we get that up there and his website's got a bunch of great stuff on it. Um, and, uh, Mark will do a write-up, I think, uh, post-show yeah. and hopefully share some yeah. of our takeaways, but Reed, this has been amazing. Thanks so much for giving us some, some great time and energy. That yeah, was my fun. My, my, my Thanks, pleasure. Jeff. I had fun. <laughs> my fun. I like that too. That was oh. my fun. Awesome. Well, had fun. Amazing. And Hey guys, don't forget, uh, to check us out at, uh, www.thinkingonpaper.xyz. You can see all the episodes. We're up on Spotify. We're up on YouTube. Reach out to us if you have an idea for a guest or a topic or something you want to see. Got some exciting stuff coming up, including a uh, potential town hall episode, Reed, which we'll be talking to you about uh, sooner than later. But uh, Mark, any closing thoughts? Yeah, let's make the town hall happen. Thank you, Reed. It's been incredible. Thank you. It's my pleasure, and I'm happy you got to stay in your box. <laughs> have a great day, guys. Bye. You can't see what's happening here. <laughs>